Hi, everyone. I'm Chris Howard, and welcome to Top of Mind. I'm thinking of this episode as kind of wrapping up our conversation about generative AI. Now, clearly, that topic will continue and it'll come up again and so on. But I wanted to round this out today by thinking about what makes generative AI productive going forward. Now, you may remember that I talked about generative AI in the trough of disillusionment. And some people thought, wow, that's really soon. That's very early. Well, the truth is that this technology is moving through the hype cycle faster than any technology that I, that I can recall. Uh, and the trough of disillusionment simply means that this is where the work is beginning, where the hard work starts. And eventually what happens when a technology comes up out of the trough is you hit the plateau of productivity by becoming more enlightened about what works and what doesn't and so on. So I wanted to take a few minutes today and just talk about what we're seeing uh, and really articulating the productivity of generative AI through use cases. Because uh, you think about use cases are where things get real. You're applying a technology and you're, you're achieving some kinds of results from that. So let's start with an example. It's a healthcare example. Imagine that you are a CIO at a hospital. And what's happening, of course, is this trend of consumerization of healthcare and access to knowledge and democratized access to, to knowledge. And this is happening both for patients as well as, as caregivers. Jeff Cribbs, who's on my healthcare and life sciences team, wrote a document studying the impact of GPT-4 on healthcare and life sciences. And he chose GPT-4 because it's more capable. It actually is has a deeper sense of logic and zero-shot learning and all those types of things that differentiate 4 from 3.5. So your CIO at a hospital, Jeff, is writing this for you. So there's this consumerization and access to information. But what's happening is there are different perceptions of GPT-4 that it makes it appear to be maybe more empathetic or more correct, perhaps, and certainly more accessible. You think about if you're waiting to get feedback from your healthcare provider, it can take several days sometimes. And so people are using GPT-4 to get better answers, or at least what they perceive to be better answers. It's also happening with the practitioners themselves. They're using GPT-4 for answers and knowledge search and so on. So clearly you want to get some control over this highly regulated environment. There are a lot of privacy issues and so on. And so Jeff walks through those opportunities and risks for the practitioners, for the regulators, for the patients, or everybody that's touched by healthcare in the hospital, and then starts to say, well, here are some things that you could do. The other thing that's making this even more complex is that the vendors of healthcare um, applications like Epic and others, of course, are moving in the same direction of building these capabilities into their systems. So think of what you might be able to do with that. Maybe it's a patient-doctor consultation, and that's being recorded, uh, like audio recorded, and then the GBT4 will create a summary of that. It's actually really interesting and beneficial because that's one of the things where errors tend to occur. Maybe it happens after the visit is done. Maybe it doesn't happen at all. And so the use of a technology that's sort of in an ambient listening situation, actually creating a better record of the interaction. And then if you have multiples of those interactions, you can start to see patterns across them, even for an individual patient or for multiple patients with similar symptoms, that kind of thing. And the way that Jeff lays this out then is to say, okay, well, here are the couple of design patterns you would use to make that work. So prompt engineering, some access to internal and protected data, the use of GPT-4 as the conversational piece of this, but then building and embedding this all into an application that the hospital, in this case, would control. Uh, the other thing that's happening that's interesting in the healthcare space is the introduction of domain-specific models. So models, for example, that Mayo Clinic is, Clinic is, exper is experimenting with now, that's really specifically tuned to the healthcare environment and the specific language and patterns and parameters that, that surround that. So they're testing that now. And I think what this is is a good representation of how an industry is disrupted, the CIO and their response to it, but also the emerging space within large language models itself. I think very quickly what's going to happen here is that you'll see the rise of these very productive, smaller, large language models that are they're domain specific, that look at a specific you know, space, in this case, the healthcare space, but emerging across all industries. And say two years from now, we're in a situation where you have multiple models running, orchestration and integration across them in the pursuit of business goals. But right now, very beginning stages, the pilots that people are experimenting with now are giving them some sense of accuracy or lack thereof and how it might be useful in a larger setting. So that example was a, a CIO example. The other thing, of course, that we're doing at Gartner is looking at use cases across all of the roles that we serve. And this is a place where you can help me. 
uh, we're out collecting use cases, pilots, what are people doing with this technology, and, and ultimately going to create that picture through research and, and show what's productive, what's more feasible, what produces results perhaps, but is harder to do. And so over the next few months, we're publishing a whole set of these kinds of use cases. If you're doing something interesting with generative AI, and it could be text or not text, it could be anything, I'd love you to put that in the comments here and, uh, and so we can see what you're doing. And also remember to put questions in the in the chat as well, because I do circle back around those and sometimes answer them in line. Uh, but we plan to do a couple of episodes where it's really just answering your questions. So back to roles. What about roles like HR? Let's say you want to maybe create a summary of a talent review. Uh, not that it would be the final version, but if you actually want to go through all of the data that you maybe have on an employee and create the draft of a performance review, that's an interesting use case. A lot of HR departments also do talent intelligence, like out in the market, what are competitors doing, what other job postings look like, that kind of thing. That's a great use case for, for GPT or for, for large language models in general. What about in legal? Um, legal, of course, is looking at all the regulations that affect a company and its operations. So using large language models is a great way to maybe get summaries of regulations and looking at how things change or how they're different from one place to another, or even just generating policy documentation uh, or summarizing policy documentation. Uh, marketing. Marketing has been a heavy user of generative AI uh, for, for a while now. Prior to all of this chat GPT stuff that happened at the end of 22, they were using it to generate uh, ad copy, you know, again, summarization of activities, maybe even things like emotion sensing uh, and, and detection. In sales, sales is constantly generating materials, sales materials. Maybe it's pitch decks or it's you know calls or post-call follow-up. Again, great use cases for this kind of technology. What about customer service? Customer service, we're talking a lot about the augmented service rep. So this is a person that's fielding incoming calls. Uh, usually, you know, have multiple screens that they're working with. Now imagine generative AI being popped in there to create easy access to knowledge to help solve the hard problems that come in to a call center. Finance, anomaly detection is a great use case there. The thing that we're watching in finance is also conversational reporting. So using conversational interfaces to complex reporting and then letting the engines work behind the scenes to actually bring that to you. Something about supply chain. So it's one of the challenges with supply chain is keeping workers in place. The turnover rate tends to be very high. And so if you can create for them a better digital experience through access to knowledge, maybe working in a warehouse, you know, and, and, and maybe even combining things like mixed reality together with generative AI, creates an environment that is really knowledge rich, but also better to work in from a design point. So you can see there are use cases. I've just given you the tip of the iceberg. We're collecting hundreds of these from across all industries to see who's impacted. I gave you a healthcare example, uh, and that's one that's easier for us to understand because we, you know, we, we interact with healthcare. But I can find use cases across multiple industries where you might not expect them. So, for example, mining, sort of heavy industry in mining, you think, well, what's what's the, you know the what's the use there? Turns out that you can actually ingest blueprints and then create interesting designs for extending a mine or creating new ones or making them more efficient or actually making them perhaps even more environmentally friendly to the extent that you could do that. And so whatever industry you're in, I want you to be thinking creatively about what you can do and share that here because we've got a lot of people watching and it would be great to sort of foster some communication about that. Let me give you a couple of concrete examples, just a couple to show that people are really doing this. I was on a board meeting with a very large grocery company. So think about packaged uh, groceries. And they are using generative AI to help employees understand the employee policies like travel policies or maybe data retention policies, all those kinds of things, which tend to be spread out across multiple documents and standing operating procedures. They've built an interface into that so you can ask very simple questions like, what's my per diem if I'm going to New York City next week? Things like that. Uh, there's a large financial institution that I work with that's using this to experiment with uh, code modernization, which is something I haven't talked a lot about. But generative AI for code generation is one of the really great productivity use cases, the numbers that we're seeing for productivity exceptionally high. Now, they're using this to test movement from COBOL 2 to COBOL 6, or even out of COBOL and into more modern languages like Python and things like that. So they're experimenting with this and checking again accuracy and so on. One thing I'll say, though, about code generation is that it increases the amount of time that you need to do testing the output. 
Uh, and when it comes to modernization, which is something that Gartner is going to be studying really closely over the next couple of months, it translates the code, but it doesn't, at this point, it doesn't actually restructure it or modernize the code itself. It changes into the languages and so on. So one of the banks is doing, is doing this. So generative AI moving into the trough of disillusionment simply means that this is where the hard work starts. And we'll find stuff that works well and stuff that doesn't work well, and we just we work through that. And what happens ultimately is that generative AI takes its place alongside the other capabilities of artificial intelligence that have been around for a decade or more. So you may remember the first episode that I recorded, I told a story about the first automobiles in Yarmouth, Nova Scotia, and that was on my mom's side of the family. I remember my father telling me about early car trips, though, so this would have been in the 40s, the late 40s, maybe the early 50s, and how the roads were so bad that you could be sure that you would blow a tire on a trip, even on just a short distance of maybe 40 or 50 miles. Roads weren't great. The tires weren't sort of industrial strength yet. And so you always had spares, and you would blow your tires, but you could be sure of it. But that didn't actually turn people off of automobiles. Uh, it said, no, this is never going to work, so you know, let's let's do something else it actually encouraged the solution to those problems. So roads got better, tires got better, that kind of thing to the point now where we have like ride flat tires. And so even still, we're progressing from that. That's the nature of change in technology and learning how to use something and to make it productive. And so again, share your stories. What are you using Gen AI for to become productive? Share those stories here, share your questions and we'll come back to them. This has been Top of Mind. Thanks for joining and we'll see you again in a couple of weeks.